Welcome to our Read series. This series is designed to encourage you to R. Read the Bible, E. Every day, A. Ask questions, and D. Determine to obey. As pastor of Oregon Trail Baptist Church, it's my goal that this time of reflection on the Bible reading from the previous week will serve as an encouragement to you to read the Bible, but will also open up opportunities to share, discuss, and ask questions about what you've discovered in God's Word, that we may grow together. As we renew our minds by the washing of the Word, we desire to draw closer to God and to each other. Anyway, let's start with a word of prayer, and we'll dive into some of the questions from last week, and then on into some of the reading from First Chronicles this week. So, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that as we continually read your word, there's always more to be discovered, and it seems like no matter where we find ourselves reading, your spirit always has truth or an application for us. This morning, as we uh, talk about First Chronicles, we just ask you to open our hearts and minds to truth in your Son's name. Amen. So to introduce some of you who are not familiar with what we're doing is we're reading through the Bible this year, um, something I encourage you to do every year. We're following a, what's called a historical Bible reading plan, and you're like, well, why are we doing First Chronicles now? Does anybody know why we're so late in the year and yet we're doing First Chronicles? What's that? The date of it. Okay, First Chronicles is actually written after the return has taken place. So last, well, two weeks ago we read about Ezra and Nehemiah and the return and some of that. Second Chronicles seems to be about that time period of Ezra and Nehemiah, maybe a little later that the author's writing. Okay, so he's, he's writing a history of Israel, much like First and Second Kings, which you read a long time ago. But this also caps off the end of the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. So I say the Old Testament, they call it the Hebrew Bible, the Jews do. But it, it kind of leaves us looking and longing for a messianic figure to come. So we had a couple questions last week as we started into the book. Why is Adam all caps in 1 Chronicles 1.1? 1, 1? And I was having a very hard time finding an answer. But I found an answer. And it's so simple, I felt embarrassed, all right? So... I was doing some searching. Let's see if I can find my searches here. Um, no, I got rid of that search. Um, so take a look at First Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. In the King James Version, what does it do when it wants to... Okay, when you see all caps for the word Lord, what does that mean? I'm sorry? Um, yes, it, it's the personal name of God, and it's a way they... Um, highlighted that to you as the reader because you could have Lord also refer to like um, you know different people who are the master of somebody else. Um, how about the capitalization of God versus the gods? This still carries over to a lot of translations today. If we're referring to the God of the Bible, we usually capitalize it, right? If we refer to, yes, the first letter. Uh, if we refer to other gods, we don't generally capitalize that. Um, Unless it's the beginning of a sentence or something like that. So Adam being in all caps in First Chronicles 1.1 1, 1 kind of threw me. And I wasn't finding any good discussion. And I was trying to search for, okay, Elizabethan English capitalization rules. And then a thought hit me and I thought, duh, that's it. So look at First Chronicles 1.1. 1, 1. There you have Adam in all caps right at the beginning. In Hebrew, he does also begin... Um, the book begins with the name Adam uh, as well. A uh, bit of a stylistic thing of how end, they will end Second Chronicles. We'll get to that next week. But now look at First Chronicles 2. What do you see with the first word of First, first Chronicles chapter 2? It's all caps. Okay, now go to First Chronicles chapter 3. It's all caps. So it's simply a stylistic thing of apparently the English, and some modern translations do this as well, as I was doing some comparison. 
where they just capitalize the first letter. I'm not sure if it's of the chapter or of uh, a paragraph. The whole the whole first word gets capitalized with you know a really large first letter, and then all the other letters are lowercase, but they're capital small letters. What's that? Is, and yours isn't. Okay. So that's interesting. Mine is a, a Cambridge. Um, I wonder if there's a difference between the Oxford and the Cambridge King James. Um, so my Bible has like chapter 6. The, the starting off chapter 6 is all capital. Um, chapter 7 now is all capital. Um, so I think that's what's happening. Yeah, it's a stylized thing. So, nothing of deep theological significance per se. Yes, yeah. So, uh, they carried it on. It, it, it's probably the best way to put that: a formatting decision. So. It's just an English formatting issue. The second thing we were talking about a bit was Keturah. And she is Abraham's wife slash concubine. And it's a little confusing because in First Chronicles 32, what we read, we actually started that in last week's reading. She's called Abraham's concubine. But in Genesis 25, she's referred to as his wife. And I'll pull that up for you. At least I thought I had it up. I must have closed it out. Anyway, uh, Genesis 25, verse 1, she's referred to as Abraham's wife. Why would this happen? Is the author making a mistake? Yeah, so Genesis 25, 1. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. So here she's called a wife, but in First Chronicles, she's called a concubine. What's happening? Do we have an heir in the Bible? Okay, no. So what's happening here? Any ideas? Oh, oh that's... I have a different approach to that, um, but, but that's an interesting approach. Uh, So I, I was a bit amazed as I was going through Bible dictionaries. A lot of them repeated a lot of the same information, which is fairly common. Keturah means like perfume or frank, fragrance. Um, her children would become like the, the tribes of Midian and some of the other tribes, which as we go through the biblical story, Keturah's children and the tribes that come from her, um, they actually are, I would say this, they're more friendly to Israel than a lot of the other Canaanite tribes. And there seems to be a little bit of a better relationship. In fact, when we get to Moses, uh, Moses in Exodus, when he flees to the wilderness and he meets Jethro, Jethro is from what tribe? The tribe of Midian, which comes from Keturah. So there's a bit of connection, which is, which is a bit interesting because Keturah being married, slash a concubine to Abraham, uh, may have passed on, and her children heard stories of the God of Israel. Obviously, Israel doesn't exist yet, but the God of the Bible, we'll put it that way. And so Midian may have had a, a somewhat of a remnant truth of that. But um, I found this article probably the most helpful, because it, uh, it, for me, it summarized some of the thoughts. I'm just going to read it here, of why, why it's possible in Genesis 25, she's referred to as a wife. But in First Chronicles, she's referred to as a concubine. And it's important to know that the chronicler, the person writing Chronicles, he's writing an edited history. Okay, A lot of water has come under the bridge. And so he's, he's picking out certain details, but he's also writing in a certain way that this generation knows and remembers certain things. And he's, he's going to emphasize certain things differently. So this is from um, a book called All the People in the Bible. Um, I found it the most helpful. Uh, 
and secure. All the people in Bible, an A to Z guide to saints, scoundrels, and other characters in scripture. Pretty good title. Keturah. Most people tend to pay little heed to Abraham after Isaac's marriage and are unaware that after Sarah's death, he married Keturah, who bore him six sons. I'm going to pause there. There is some debate as to when he was married. Um, some think he married Keturah before Sarah's death. Um, I, I just haven't d dove in there. Abraham would be well over like 100, 120 years old here. So to have a child with, by, by Sarah with Isaac at around 100, um, whatever happens with Keturah uh, is somewhat still miraculous as well. And I haven't dove in there, so I'm not going to comment too much. Early Jewish law gave the second wife little more status than that of a concubine to protect the heritage of the children of the first marriage. In fact, First Chronicles calls Keturah a concubine probably to allay any question of Isaac's legitimacy as a patriarch of Israel. Keturah's sons were men of courage, wisdom, and honor. Abraham endowed them and sent them to the east where they found six tribes. This established Abraham as the father of most uh, of almost all the Semitic peoples, the Jews through Isaac, the Arabs through Ishmael, his son by Hagar, Sarah's Egyptian slave, and the Midianites and several lesser tribes through the sons of Keturah. While these tribes of Keturah's sons were not Jewish, the Jews seemed to feel closer kinship to them than to the descendants of Ishmael. Um, and that's all I, I think it's pertinent. So what I find interesting here is this early Jewish law giving um, more status to Sarah as the predominant wife. Why might that be important theologically? Why is it important that Sarah is still remembered as the first wife? Isaac came for her, and Isaac was the one through whom God promised, and God, God said, I'll, I'll bring a son through you, and this will be the one through whom the nation will come and fulfill the promises. So the chronicler is writing this, and he doesn't want his reader to get Keturah and Sarah mixed up and confused. He's writing this in such a way to remind you that Keturah was not the same status of a wife as Sarah being the first wife. Um, so, and the lines of the ancient Near East of wife and concubine blur kind of a bit. So that is a discussion I don't intend to have because it's probably over my head, to be quite honest. So, yes, yeah, they do still today. Um, oh, that okay. You just triggered something in my mind. Um, there's this odd passage in I think it's Leviticus, and uh, it talks about if if a man divorces his wife. And she marries another, and that husband dies or gets rid of her, that man cannot remarry the, that wife. And the reasoning for that is for it is confusion. And being involved with divorce and things, it's a complicated issue. One scholar has, has, has brought this to the table, but he's been very careful. I wish I could remember his name. He's been careful not to say, I can prove this. He's like, but I just kind of wonder, okay? And here's the thing. In the Arab world today, they have temporary marriages. So what can happen is you divorce your wife for a week or a month or two months. She marries another man. She serves as his wife for a few months, and then she comes back to you. If that type of practice was happening all the way back then, that law in the Old Testament may have been against that type of practice. The problem is, that's a really neat, tantalizing concept. But we just don't have any proof for it, either way. So we can't rest there. Um, and most people are like scratching their heads, like, what exactly is happening with that Old Testament law? Uh, but how, how the marriage and concubine relationship worked in the Old Testament is very foreign to us, both by time and culture. So um, there's much I have yet to learn on that. So. Any comments or questions from this week's reading? We are pretty much from 1 Chronicles 1 all the way to chapter 17 this week. Any comments, questions, things you noticed?
Oh, let me see if I can find something. That was chapter... Alright, so it's verse 21, and what was the other verse? 20, okay. Let's see if I can... Tharps on Shemineth to Excel. slow. Harps on the octave. So, um, it looks like it's, that word is used 31 times in the Old Testament. It looks like it's, it's prominent, predominantly used in Leviticus. Yep. So it is eighth, because looking how it's used in Leviticus, you have the eighth day for circumcision, eighth day several times, uh, but probably referring to a musical instrument, like we have an eight note scale. So, yeah. It's interesting to note here in several, a couple of the Psalms, they say it's upon you know, the, the eighth. I wonder, right, uh, or possibly were there other scales at play too, and they had to clue the musicians into what type of scale you're playing this on. I, I'm not sure. That's it. Okay, so. So I'm, I'm using the lemma, and I'm sorry to use, lemma refers to the root of a word. So when you say the word running, you're not going to find running in the dictionary. You're going to look up the word run. Okay. So when I'm searching these, I'm searching for the Hebrew lemma, not the word as it appears in the text, but the word, the root word that's from, technically root word, it's a little, not quite the same. But the word you would look up in the dictionary, in a Hebrew dictionary. Um, this one has me confused, off the cuff, because it's a marriageable young girl. So, could be. I gotcha. Oh, you're uh, not. Your your hunch is uh, verified. Um, so, uh, right there, um, it may, uh, let's see here, the, this is, um, a Hebrew, a Hebrew lexicon, but it has here, i.e. with the virgin voice, sharp, or German soprano. So being in a musical section, it probably means soprano. Mm -hmm. yep. so. Yes. Um, yeah. It, it just gets a little complicated for us because we don't use a lot of the same musical terms or notations that they use. So good question. Generally, yes. Used both ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. so. Any other things of note, comment, or question? Let me uh, talk through a little bit then.
feel free to, if you, something comes to mind. First and Second Chronicles is a bit of a repeat of First and Second Kings. And remember, in Hebrew scriptures, this was all really one scroll, just one document. Um, our Bibles have chopped them up uh, into two. Um, again, it's the last book in the Hebrew Bible, um, and in some ways it prepares us for the New Testament because the hopes and dreams of Israel, the promises of God, had they been all fulfilled by this time of the time of this writing? Had the Jews returned? Do they have a temple built? Yes. But what was missing when they built that second temple? I'm sorry. Yeah, God's presence. I remember the elders wept when they coronated or they, they had the big ceremony at the temple because they remembered the previous temple, which I'm thinking they had to be really old elders because it's been 70 years of exile. Uh, but they remembered when the previous temple and, and the glory, and they knew about when God's glory, they had heard the stories when God's glory came down and Solomon, um, and, what's the term, inaugurated the temple or uh, initiated the temple or dedicated, there we go, Solomon in First Samuel, uh, or Second Samuel 4, I believe, um, dedicates the temple. So God's glory comes down and fills it. That doesn't happen the second time. But this is written after the exile, and there's this emphasis within the book, and the first several chapters, um, really what we've read so far is chapter 1 to 17, they're emphasizing a couple things. One is there's a coming messianic king. And there's a hope for a new temple. Okay, um, Those things are going to be really predominant throughout the book. Uh, the first nine chapters um, we got talking a little bit about last week. How do most of us view, if we're all honest, about the first nine chapters where it's genealogy after genealogy? We'd rather skip it. Why? It's just a bunch of names. But almost all, if not all, key characters from the stories of the Old Testament get listed in some way in those chapters. It's like a literary way for the writer to remind you of these different stories and these different people and how they move the narrative forward. Um, and there's two things kind of emphasis there. One is David as king. His line is important because it's going to be from the Davidic line Messiah will come. The other thing that somewhat gets emphasized in the genealogy chapters is the element of the priesthood and, and how uh, Aaron's priesthood was, was very important and significant. Uh, but do we have any other priesthoods coming in the line in Scripture? Christ, yes, but he's after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? So you got these roles functioning of king and priest and those are somewhat emphasized in the first nine chapters. In chapters 10 to 29, so we're at 10, really 1 to 7, or chapter 10 to 17, what stories about David are missing? The things he did wrong, his failures. Okay? Early on, some of the times when he's running from Saul, and he wasn't trusting God, but he was depending on his own wittingness and ability to deceive the, the men around. All that gets kind of, ooh, it's just not there. His sin with Bathsheba, it's not there. Okay. Um, we also have new stories. So in we'll get to chapter 22 as you're reading this week, where he's preparing to build the temple. Okay. We don't get that much, that much detail about this in First and Second Kings. Uh, also, we're going to get in chapter 28, where he is given plans for the, the temple. Well, who else was given special plans for a building structure in the Old Testament? Okay, Solomon. Well, I, I think they were handed down from David to Solomon. But yes, God communed with Solomon. Think before that. Moses. Now, it wasn't the temple, but Moses was given the plans for the tabernacle, right? And the tabernacle becomes like the temporary temple, right? So there's this, David in some ways is echoing Moses. And in some ways, um, the, what I think is somewhat happening here is throughout First and Second Chronicles, we're seeing David portrayed as a good
good, godly king. Is he perfect? No. But are there elements of the Messiah that will be like David? Yes. You see, Jesus is perfect, right? But you have a lot of these Old Testament characters where David, his, the image of who he is as the future messianic king, you, as an Old Testament reader, you might be reading or knowing the story of David and think, if you're living through the life of David, think, is he the messianic king? But then when he fails and sins, you're going, no, he's not the messianic king. And we haven't got yet to Second Chronicles with the other kings, but there's kings that give us a bright hope. And if you're living through that time, you know the promises of the one who would come to crush the seed of the serpent. You know the promises of the one who would be Messiah and who will rule and reign and draw all nations back to the Lord. And you're looking at the different kings, hoping, longing, one of them will be that Messiah. But were any of the Old Testament kings that Messiah? No. They all failed. Um, they all um, failed to be what they were called to be. But is there coming a Messiah who will rule and reign from the throne of David? Who will be perfect? Yes. Um, as I was covering this and listening to this, it jogged my mind to something I was listening to oh, earlier this summer. There's an element where a lot of key Old Testament figures find their fulfillment in Christ. Okay. Now, what I want to say by that is, is it's kind of a mirroring. So Matthew does a, a pretty comprehensive job in his gospel of how Christ is a better, he's better than Moses, right? He's a new prophetic leader, better than Moses. There's also some themes picked up, and some of this gets lost, but Christ is a better Joshua. Now, it's not quite in, in Matthew, but if you think about it, who conquered the promised land? Joshua, who led the people into victory. It was Joshua. And there, there's elements, the name Joshua, the Old Testament name Joshua, is connected to the name Jesus. So Jesus is better than the conqueror Joshua. Okay, And there's several key characters, such as now we're at David. David, the king of Israel, the man after God's own heart. Was David a godly man? Yes. Did he fail? Yes, but Jesus is the godly king who never fails. So a lot of the key, bigger than life, as it were, picked characters in the Old Testament are fulfilled in Jesus. And he, he so what we have in, in miniature of these different Old Testament characters, Christ fulfills in the New Testament in surprising sometimes ways. And uh, some of the language of the New Testament picks up on some of those things. Um, so anyway, I probably better stop there because we'll talk about Second Chronicles more next week. Any other comments or questions? Or did I just throw mud everywhere? <laughs> I threw mud. <laughs> I want I want to encourage you very much to read your Bible with an eye to Jesus. Okay, um, I, I'm a little bit leery sometimes when people take a verse and they somehow make that whole verse about Jesus and you're scratching your head like that's really pushing that verse, okay? But all the scriptures were there to point to who? To Jesus. He's the climax, the culmination of God's redemption plan. And not that every verse in the Bible is about Jesus, but every verse, every chapter is in a way, pointing or helping you along the path toward understanding who Jesus is and what he's done. Uh, this is why I find it a bit odd, and I'm kind of on a hobby horse tangent here, but most systematic theology books start with a big long section called prolegomena. Pro prolegomena. And I probably spelled it wrong. Anybody know what that funny word means? They start their systematic theologies with a prolegomena. It means discussion of first things. And usually in a prolegomena of a systematic theology, this is what they talk about. Should we talk about the Bible first? Because that's God's word. Or should we talk about God first? Because he's the source of the Bible. Now, to, then they spend pages and pages and much blood spilling the ink of which one should come first and I think that's backwards. 
Because what is the whole Bible about? Oh, okay, a little broader than God. Okay. When I took um, methods of Bible study, first class I had in college, and then Life of Christ, this theme came to me time and time again. Scripture is about the person and work of Christ. Now, that's important. Person. What sets Christ apart as a person? I'm sorry? He's perfect. Has any Old Testament character been perfect? No. Adam and Eve had the best sh shot at things. Yeah, well, yeah, they were complete and perfect for a time, but they fell. Okay? But, okay, let's... So Christ was perfect... And the Old Testament's clear. There's, um, we think of Romans in the New Testament. There's none perfect, no, not one. But e Ecclesiastes 7.20, there's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So no one's perfect, but Christ is more than perfect. What is he? He's God. And that's important. And we, we talk about this in the realm of he's the God-man. And some of this comes from, like, the book of Daniel, where we see this son of man figure. And where is the son of man figure seated? It's the right hand of the throne of God. So you have this son of man figure um, developed. I don't think the Jews fully understood who their Messiah would be. I think they were still developing an understanding of that. I don't think they had a full comprehension he was going to be the God-man. But in Christian theology, as the New Testament develops and as the apostles are writing and as Christ reveals himself, Christ is 100% God and 100% man, and there's a bit of mystery to that, of how that works. But then, now that we talked a little bit about the person of Christ, and the, what about his work? What was the work of Christ? Okay, Christ, his work culminated in his death on the cross. Now there's you know, things that happen up to that where he fulfills Old Testament promises and prophecies. Um, he, he, uh, there, there's a lot to be discussed in the New Testament of what he does for the 33 years or so he walked here on earth. But it culminates in the cross. And there on the cross, the God-man, the man Christ Jesus... He died on our behalf. So Christ on the cross, as God, he had the value of eternality. As man, he could die, because God can't die. As the God-man, he could die and actually not just atone in Old Testament language and cover our sin, but he could die and pay for or cleanse us of our sin. And so it's important to know his person because without his person, we won't understand his work. And his work of his death on the cross is pivotal because the Old Testament is pointing towards and pointing toward this. Let's go way back to Genesis. Adam and Eve, perfect in the garden. God makes them. He sets them in the garden. They fell. They sinned. Has any character in the Old Testament been perfect from then on? No. And it doesn't seem to matter how or what God does with people. People are always the failure point. Yes. Very much so. What were some ideas of what they thought about Messiah, what he would be like? Okay, that he'd be rich, he'd be a ruler, okay? A strong ruler, a, 
conquering ruler. Yeah. Now, do we have Old Testament passages that sound that way about Messiah? Yes. That's where it gets odd, because then you have passages like Isaiah 53 with the suffering servant. The Jews were wrestling with this, and you get into Second Temple literature. So Second Temple is um, the Jewish, I guess, phrase. Intertestamental is what Christians would say. It's the time period between the Old and New Testament. And there were some Jews discussing the concept that there would be two messiahs. Now, that sounds weird to us, but the, mind you, they didn't have the New Testament yet. And what they're seeing in some of this, they're seeing messianic passages talking about the Messiah to come rule and reign. But they're also seeing passages of a Messiah who would suffer and die. And this doesn't seem to fit. So they weren't sure what to do with it, and they're kind of wrestling with it, and they're, they're coming up with different ideas, and they're exploring these options. But now we see Christ with a little bit more clarity than they saw, because we have more info. When Christ came the first time, did he rule and reign? No. He suffered and died. But is he coming again to rule and reign? And you see, a while back we talked about how the prophets were, they were like people, um, and they, they were looking into the future, and they could see points, and there's these mountain peaks, and they could see on to different points, but they missed what was happening here. Because God didn't give them that info yet. They didn't know what was happening. They didn't have all the details. So in their mind's eye, and, and just like when you look out at Laramie Peak, it is hard to tell the difference between this peak and this peak. You can't always tell distances very easy. They blur in our minds. And so as God is revealing to the Old Testament prophets what he's coming and what the Messiah will be like, they're not always clear on all the distinctions. They're just putting it out there. Now, we live later, and we, we have a higher elevation, not that we're smarter. We, we have the ability to look back and say, okay, this is what God's doing. Okay, and so all, all that to say, um, Christ is a perfect man. He's, he's God in flesh. His work is the work of redemption, which, by the way, isn't done yet. Now, Christ's work is complete. But as the old song says, he's still working on me. Uh, it took him just a week to make the moon and stars, the sun and earth, Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me. Okay? And we are still longing for the culmination where sin is rid out of our world and it's gone and it's, we are in the new heaven and new earth living with God for eternity. We're longing and looking toward that end. But when I think of theology and I think of if the Bible is about the person and work of Christ, the Old Testament is pointing forward to Christ. The New Testament emphasizes who he is and then the, the writings and whatever is... is the apostles writing, Paul and whatnot, is clarifying and defining how we as Christians live out this life in Christ, and then on into John and the Revelation and what's going to come. The person and work of Christ, I think, should be the center of where we start our theology. And, 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 and I'm, the odd thing is here, the only person who's wrote a theology book that matches this design is an Anglican that I know of, so that kind of throws me off. Um, but think about it. If Christ and his, the person work of Christ, and sometimes we would summarize that and say the gospel, the good news of what Christ has done. I like to think of it this way. If we call the gospel, or the person work of Christ, how Christ died for our sins, then we talk about the church. How does the church fit in with that? church is a body of believers, of people who believe the gospel and choose to live out a life of faith together. Um, we talk about um, angels. Now, in, the New, in Hebrews, they're called all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. And the opposite, so these are people who, not people, these are supernatural beings who assist with those who are part of the, the body of faith. And on the flip side of that, you have demons. Those are spiritual entities that oppose the gospel. You have um, the future, or ecclesiology, 
what's the, the future culmination of things because of what's happened with the gospel. Uh, you, you then have uh, just all, to me, all issues of theology can come back to the person and work of Jesus Christ. And when we study and know him and seek to allow him to live out in our lives, yes, we're going to have, you know, the bibliology or the Bible. And the Bible is the book God has given us declaring this story. And he didn't just give us 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 5, for I declare unto you that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's not all the gospel. I mean, that is the gospel. But we also have four books called the gospels. We also have the entire Old Testament, which makes up two-thirds of your Bible, pointing to the need of the person and work of Christ. And so um, we have the Bible as God's word. Um, anyway, so any comments, questions? You kind of Either I took myself on a tangent there, or you all took me there. Yeah. I am on a tangent. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, the Bible is his story. And it's the story of God working in and through human history. It's the story of God redeeming all in humanity. And I think one element we sometimes miss, it's a story of God desiring relationship. God wants to work with his people. Um, if you've been reading uh, screw tip letters with us um, by C.S. Lewis, he, he notes how the demonic realm desires to work not through people as much as kind of overriding people. But God wants to work through us as his children, as his partners. So God doesn't arm twist you. He doesn't force you. But he does woo you. He does uh, seek to uh, have a relationship with you. And when God made Adam and Eve and placed him in the garden, I probably go here too often. But when God placed him there, he gave them purpose and design. They were to do something there. Question, could God have made the garden absolutely perfect with nothing for Adam and Eve to do? He could have made the whole world that way, but he didn't. What's that? Oh, okay. He didn't because we're made in his image and in the same way that God is a worker and God is creative and God works with his hands and does things. Not that God has hands. Okay, so please don't tip me too far there. God made us to do that. And so we're his imagers. We're like him. And he desires to work in and through us and allow us to be creative with our hands and with our time and to do things. So I better stop there. We've got about 10 minutes before our morning service. We'll pick up some next week. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoy uh, First Chronicles. And do try to, in your minds, as you read it this week, um, on into Second Chronicles, Try to think through what some differences were between the Chronicles record and the King's record. This is not conflicting history, but it's, it's, it's kind of a um, converging history. That might be a good way to put it. So let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. And uh, Lord, we're thankful that as Israel here in the Old Testament looks back on their own history, a history that was filled with hopes, and disappointments, a history with great characters like King David and a line of kings who turned their back on you, a history filled with priests who lived as they ought and then priests who defiled the temple. Father, may you give us a heart longing and desire for that personal relationship with you. Now that Christ has, has died on the cross, he's atoned and cleansed for our sin and he's opened up the way for us to have fellowship and communion with you. I ask that you would enable us to live like that this week knowing that Christ has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Lord, we thank you for this book of the Bible and how it points us forward longing for the Messiah to come, longing for the one who would Lord, now that we look back and we see that Messiah as
as Christ. Lord, may you help us live in light of that. Now may we long for that future day where all is set right and we dwell forever in the new heaven and new earth with you. We ask that you bless our service to follow. Bless us as we read your word this morning. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.